Raise your hand if you volunteered in high school. Keep your hands raised if you continued volunteering in college. Thank you, you can put your hands down. You know, statistics show that 77% of college students want to volunteer. However, only 21% actually do. There is a disconnect between students who want to volunteer and nonprofits who are in need of volunteers. Specifically at USC, we asked people who wanted to volunteer why they weren't currently volunteering. They said they had struggles trying to find opportunity, arranging transportations, and they didn't understand the new and they didn't understand the new requirements now in place after COVID-19. We are the solution. Allied is a volunteer matching service that specializes in the niche of college students seeking volunteering opportunities. At Allied, we aim to bridge the gap between college students who want to volunteer and nonprofit organizations who need volunteers. We do this by matching qualified student volunteers with appropriate service opportunities, providing transportation recommendations, and grouping prospective volunteers together in order to create a safer, more effective service environment on campus. Here's a look at our user-friendly website by which we deliver this service. When consumers enter our website, they are first met with two different forms, one for prospective volunteers and one for nonprofit organizations. Within these two forms, there's a vast array of questions that we will use in order to assess the qualifications of individual volunteers and the needs that have to be met within nonprofit organizations. We will then compile all that data together in order to create the best fit matches for both parties. After doing that, we'll use our corporate phone to text both parties an intensive list of all the different logistics necessary to get from point A to point B with fluidity. So why not? As you may assimilate into a post-COVID world, people are searching for connection with more just one member. However, people have fallen out of the process of volunteering and organizations have lost touch with their volunteer base. <coughs> Nationwide, the number of volunteers has dropped every year since 2005. And more recently, over two or three volunteers have decreased or stopped volunteering entirely due to the pandemic. Now we want to show you our business model. For prospective volunteers, we are offering our services of matching transportation, and community for free, but our website will have ads. And then, if they want the premium version for $3 a month, they can get rid of ads. For nonprofits, we are going to charge $5 per volunteer match in our Tier 1. In our Tier 2, we plan to charge $90 for 20 volunteer matches. So this is a look at our market sizing at Align. Because Align is a social entrepreneurship venture, we focused our market sizing more on the impact we would have in people's lives rather than the monetary gains we personally would gain as a company. So first up, for the market segment of college students, we have a total attainable market of 15.5 million. That is all college students who, according to our market research within the United States, want to volunteer. Then, we have our serviceable attainable market of all Los Angeles college students who want to volunteer, again, using that research we gathered throughout our market research process. And then finally, we have our serviceable obtainable market of 34,000 USC students who want to volunteer. Next, we have the market sizing for nonprofit organizations. In the first category of total attainable market, we have all nonprofits registered in the United States who need volunteers and lack volunteers. Then we have our serviceable attainable market of all nonprofits in California that need volunteers. And finally, we have our serviceable obtainable market of all nonprofits in downtown Los Angeles that need volunteers. So, in terms of traction, each of all the organizations that we are currently in contact with they said that this is an idea that they stand behind and that they can sort of say themselves as willing to testify for. Specifically, we have a letter of validation from the Google Media Center. We have a mix of both local and national nonprofits. So this is our current growth plan. As of right now, we are raising interest in both USC students and local nonprofits. Non and early in the next year, we plan on doing a small scale rollout matching 25 USC students to five to six nonprofits in the local area. So it's to continue scaling throughout the semester into the summer, as well as adding our participation features into our service package. <coughs> uh, 
Um, this chart highlights progress in Canada to the states. The horizontal axis represents how much time agencies spend using these services to fund the organization that matches their needs. And the vertical axis represents who the target of their primary agency is. As you can see, there is currently no service serving the existing population that does not also supply a large source of work to the audit, which is the gap that we have. This is our team. The reason we came up with our solution is collectively, we have 16 years of experience donating our time to nonprofit organizations. Furthermore, we are USC college students, which is our target demographic. Again, we are aligned here to bridge the gap between volunteers and nonprofits. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Record labels. Record labels are simply too predatory and will take advantage of artists when making deals. Take the example of Gazi Garcia, or stage name, Lil Pump. The record label gave him $10 million up front, asking for $20 million back over through royalties. Gazi Garcia, not being financially responsible, spent all $10 million. He now owes $20 million to a record label, and as a result, he won't see a single cent of his royalties for the next 20 to 30 years. In simpler words, his record label took advantage of him, and he's broke. Second, money. Musicians trying to break into the, in, into the music industry simply cannot raise capital. This type of problem has been verified by small artists like Ingrid Griffin, who said it is difficult to break into the industry when I don't have a following, when, a game following, when I don't have a record label or a manager. This traction has been verified by artists like Egobert, with over 500,000 monthly Spotify listeners, and other small artists. Now, let's look at the untapped potential. Nearly 20% of Gen Z invest, and nearly 63% of Gen Z listens to music daily. What do we get from these two statistics? Gen Z likes to invest, and they like to listen to music. Why don't we make a startup that combines the both? That's where music trade comes in. A, a stock market for music where fans can invest their artists through buying stock, which is price determined by supply and demand, and they can then gain royalties off of this. Now what this does is first off, this fractionalizes record labels. The common person can now gain access to an artist by simply investing in them, thus taking away that issue of predatory record labels. And artists now have fans who are quite literally invested in them and their success. Have you ever heard someone say, man, I've been listening to that guy since 2008, 2009, 2010. Imagine if they were invested in since 2008, 2009, 2010. Here are two mock-ups shown. This is actually a wide, minimal, viable product of our product. You can check it out where you can buy stuff. You can check out uh, the music they're playing. And this is a mobile mock-up that we plan to put into development later. I am a full stack engineer who can develop this. Um, and the market, let's look. Our total decibel market is 487 million people, which is the amount of monthly music listeners. This converts to $53.37 billion. We then have 285 million, which is the amount of paid music subscribers. This converts to $12.2 billion. And we then have 23.89 million people who are avid music listeners in the United States who invest. Now you might be asking, why are the question marks there? Because nothing has been done in this space. And with Visa Trade, we're going to find out how much we can make from them. Now, let's look at our revenue model. It's two prompt. First off, is commission based. We take 20 cents off of each transaction under $20, and an additional 1% charge off of each transaction greater than $20. This type of model is what a lot of traditional stockbrokers like TD Ameritrade and Fidelity use. And the ad based stream. We're going to put lower low, banners on the lower section of the screen, which is what a lot of our apps do today. And it's worked for them, it'll work for us. Now, let's look at the expected cost. Legal fees is about $10,000 for about 30 hours with a legal team, plus a chief compliance officer. Then we have marketing costs. Through hiring brand ambassadors, getting digital creators to endorse us, and marketing campaigns, we expect about $10,000 to be spent. And then we expect another $5,000 to be spent in operational costs through using databases like Firebase, as well as app development. Our metrics, we expect, we expect about 100,000 downloads in the first year. 10 transactions in the first year, which then amounts to about $55,000 in our first year revenue. This minus our, minus our cost amounts to about $30,000 in first year profit. Now let's look at the competition. What I want to emphasize here is that we are the first mover in this industry. We are the only app to create a stock market for artists where you can take an artist's IPO, the price is then determined by supply and demand, and then you can gain royalties off of that artist depending on how much equity you own. And that's why the, most of the other artists in this space are NFTs. First off, we're small artists specialized, which, no, which a lot of other platforms are not. Second, we have a neutral environmental impact. A lot of NFTs have detrimental environmental impacts. 
we are then supply and demand based. We take an artist IPO, and then their price is determined by supply and demand. And lastly, we have an ad revenue issue where a lot of other people don't have. Our cost to use is also minimal. All you have to do is just download the app, scroll down, and see which artists you like. A lot of these other platforms, you have to subscribe simply to view the artists and buy equity in them, or you know, buy NFTs from them. And that's where a lot of our competitive advantage is coming. First off, as I said, we are the first mover in this industry. There is no app like us. Second, there's only NFT competitors which are known to have detrimental environmental impacts. Third, we garner the AMC hype of Gen Z. Why did Gen Z like AMC and GameStop so much? They grew up watching movies and they grew up playing video games. What else did they do? They grew up listening to music, and that's where music trade comes in. And we have connections across media and tech. The duality of our two advisors gives us the upper hand in both industries, and that's where the team comes in. First off is your team, me, Sid Chata, the founder and CEO. I am a full stack engineer who's built both an app to help students with procrastination habits and a website to help teach people AI. I've marketed both of these and I've co developed the app. I worked at major tech companies like Cisco, having industry experience, and I also have connections across tech and media. Like Amit, one of our advisors, the CEO and managing director of a $7 billion market cap engineering company. He has connections like C level executives at Intel, the board of directors at NVIDIA. There's also Eager, and our another advisor who helped gain artists on this platform. He has over 500,000 monthly Spotify listeners and has connections like Playboy Cardi and other artists like that. Here is a timeline. We plan in December to finish front end development of our app. We then plan to finish back end in February. We then plan to beta test the app in March. We plan to gain funding in April. We plan to launch our marketing campaign in May. And we plan to release our app on the App Store in June. That's all. Let's dive into our streams of revenue. 
We begin with direct sales, which begins with online retail. Through things like our website store, which is up right now, Amazon, and Zoomia is a state-specific online store. Then we want to move into physical stores starting in Southern California, such as Jack's, Tilly's, and even the USC bookstore. As with any physical product, marketing is a big part of our push in the beginning of sales, and we want to start on the USC campus to test if our target demographic will actually buy the product. Then we want to move into pro skater sponsorships, which is how the majority of big skate companies sell their product. And finally, we want to target a portion of our marketing towards parents, because many skaters are under the age of 14 and don't make financial decisions for themselves. Now, our longer-term revenue strategy revolves around licensing. And this involves getting a provisional patent for the technology and licensing out to the big skate companies to make their beanies with the protection, put their logo on it, and give us a royalty. Now you can see the pricing for each beanie behind me. And keep in mind, these costs are right now producing on a small scale. Given better manufacturing and larger order sizes, we can likely get these costs down and increase margins. Now our TAM is skaters worldwide at about $3.6 billion. Our SAM is about $270 million, and that's skaters in the US under the age of 24. And our SOM is about $54 million, and that includes the audience we realistically believe we could reach within about one year of heavy sales and marketing. Now there is some competition in the helmet alternative space. However, there is no other product out there that makes a helmet that is thin, looks like a BB, soft, targeted directly at skaters, and cost efficient. A little bit of background on my experience. I worked at a financial consulting group for two years, giving me a strong finance background. I'm also an Eagle Scout, and I have extensive experience in woodworking, blacksmithing, and making physical products. Here's a little bit about what we're planning to do next. First, we want to finalize our product and manufacturing process, then get into testing and certification so that we can tell you for a fact the product works. Then we want to move to begin online sales and apply for a provisional patent for the technology, and then move to start doing physical selling and getting that pro skater sponsorship that we need for marketing. At Impact Beanies, we're going to be changing the skating industry forever. We're hoping to save lives and make a safer world for skaters without compromising the style that they value. I hope you'll be along for the ride. Thank you. Um, and secondly, residential complexes are simply just 
not incentivized to solve this problem for themselves. Um, a question we get a lot is, why don't the buildings themselves just reach out to tenants? Um, and so this, is, this can kind of be chalked up to a couple of things. Um, first, the financial incentive for the buildings is simply not large enough for them to go out and create their own platform, do their own investment market research. Um, and secondly, they're really not willing to send their own tenants to competitors to get parking spots. Um, so that was a really fundamental issue, and really we think that a third-party service is perfect, and uh, that comes to the next slide. So what is Parkpoint? Parkpoint is a leasing spot service dedicated to alleviating problems in big cities, specifically parking issues. So our model is a three-step process. First, we're going to prove demand in a given location. Uh, we're going to do market research, send out surveys, but most importantly, we're going to the leasing managers directly, and we're asking about the issues. We're asking about the parking situation. Um, from our experience, these building, buildings with shortages are super willing to share their wait list with us. And actually, we've had two buildings who are like, in fact, we'll give you the wait list. We'll reach out to them. We need to solve this problem. And so then next, we go to negotiate a master lease. We're going to go to buildings with surpluses, and we're going to basically negotiate a master bolt lease deal, um, secure the lease, and then we're going to sublease those spots to tenants from buildings with uh, shortages. So this is a prototype of our website. This is how the front page will look. And then you can see that this will be the registration where we'll find out exactly what our tenants need. And yeah, this is a hypothetical deal example. So we would lease 30 spots at $60 a month for 12 months. Sell these 30 spots at $90 a month for 12 months, and with a profit of $10,000 just for 30, 30 spots. It's a very simple but powerful model. So the beauty of our business model, first of all, we don't actually have to own the real estate to profit off of it. Um, this means less initial capital than traditional real estate investment. Um, and second of all, the, the bulk lease model allows us complete freedom in rate adjustment, meaning you know whatever we decide, we can adjust our rates according to profit maximization per spot. So how do we come up come up on this model? Um, really, it, it's it's based in traction, iteration, and communication with our customers. So throughout this process, we really leveraged our status as students, went to these buildings, and said, you know, we want to help you with this issue. Are you willing to work with us? And we iterated our model based on all of their feedback. And in the next couple slides, we'll get into the, those iterations. Um, but really, the strength of our model comes from client outreach and really communicating with how can we help you. Um, and then also, I would like to note that we talked a lot about competitors, um, offers they've had, and we really took that competition in mind and strengthened our model based off of competitors' values. So after doing more research about what um, our competitors do in the market, we can see that public parking basically doesn't take any of the boxes, doesn't have an online platform, no consistent availability, there are no annual leasing options, and none of these companies actually focus on residential accommodations. So a lot of the time, for students in LA, or people that are coming to LA to live annually, coming to live for short term, you know, um, packages or whatever. And I think that it's really important to have all four components, and this really gives us that competitive edge. Essentially, what we're doing is we're proving demand before making this transaction. This allows for a seamless, long-term, sustainable model, and that's where Parkwood comes in and provides that competitive edge. So this is what our market size is looking like. The market is $100 billion globally. Um, within the United States, we have $9 billion. And the serviceable obtainable market, just within the US, just within the US area, with the five buildings that we interviewed, we realized that there's potential for $600,000 worth of revenue. So let's talk about scalability. Um, first, we would like to arrange parking agreements in the USC area. And really, in this step, we want to leverage our status as students, and we want to build our brand. Um, next, we're going to expand to other areas of LA, such as DTLA and Koreatown, and harness the same model. Um, and we really know the LA area well. Um, but really, the third step is most important, and I think the most powerful step, and that's replicate this model to scale outside of LA. Um, so really, I think the beauty of this is we can integrate our solution into any city with parking issues, and that just so happens to be every single big city in the world. So yeah, that's us and our team comprises of me and Pearson. Um, we both have, we both actually connected because we both have a passion for sneaker reselling. Um, I started a website and had a start, you know, we had this like startup growth idea. But we realized that the um, parking model, Parkpoint, has some fundamental, like some of the fundamental principles are almost the same, which is reselling and making profit out of it. 
So I'm a real estate development major here, and I actually have uh, experience in real estate development, um, architecture, and urban planning. And really, we realized that the fabric of this company is urban planning and understanding the social fabric um, and the real estate fabric of, of the big city. And so really, we want to take the real estate aspect and understand the market, integrate our model, and do something. She's also a host of Instagram, Instagram interview series with up-and-coming shoes and fashion. 
contributors. Here's an excerpt from her testimony. She is surprised that she hasn't seen this product before, and yet she is excited to buy it, and she also believes this is the perfect time to strike. Yeah, so thank you, James. I'll be uh, talking a little bit more about the finances today. So a little bit uh, before we start off, I have I want to tell you about some assumptions that we have. We do aim to produce and sell around 4,000 units in our first year. This is with the assumption that there's an initial stock of 1,000 units per product line, and since we have two products, that would make it to 2,000, and with an average restock rate of two annually, that would make it to a 4,000. As uh, James mentioned before, we do want to set our price at around $18 per product, just to be a little bit on more of a competitive side in our market landscape. There is an estimation production cost for per product to be around $2.5 US dollars. As for some important calculation, there is an estimated annual profit of $57,000 in our first year. Of course, this is with the assumption that we do sell all 4,000 units in our first year. As for the break even, there is around $5,806. 0.5 US dollars that we would need in order to make our firm a positive net profit within our first year. As for our market sizing, there are there's Tam, Sam, and Song. With Tam, that is around 30 million. And what I did here was basically just an uh, estimation of the US population multiplied by 10%, which is a female demographic aged from 15 to 35 that are open to trying our products. As for Sam, I just multiplied TAM by another 10% to reflect that same demographic in California. And with Sam, there is also a, an assumption that there will be a full penetration rate of all the beauty influencers that Max have, has connections to and all their subscribers. Um, as for Sam, I multiply that by another 10% to reflect um, the same demographic in the LA County, which would uh, be as, because we want to start um, from the LA County. Um, yeah, so my name is Matthew Guo. I'm really passionate about management consulting and finances. My name is James Yim. I've previously given a presentation to UC Irvine on the intersection of photo theory and computer vision. And I'm Max Trotter. I previously launched three eyeshadow palettes, and I was a BD guru for a long time. So together, we make the dream team. Thank you very much.
um, love and family, but she has had enough time to really um, address it. Then we'll suggest blocking off time for her to call her parents or connect with her long lost friends. In other words, 25th hour uses Jennifer's user input to propose schedule recommendations with machine learning algorithms. From a combination of personal preferences, conventional suggestions, and external resources, Jennifer gets proposed um, calendar events in, that fit in her schedule. Moreover, we'll use association algorithms to suggest events to do in her leisure or, um, or for example, resources to look at in her self-care time. And at the end of the week, she will get a visualization of how close she got to the prioritization goals we got in the beginning. And she'll be able to reflect on the past week and sell each week with a clear path. 24 hour truly creates a unique experience to make Jennifer's um, activity aware of her time that she spent on different aspects of her life. Yeah, so why not? 70% of work from workers, Americans working from home during the pandemic, are struggling to maintain a healthy work life balance. Well, 65% of remote workers are working. Furthermore, 70% of those already rely on digital calendars to manage their time, which is a large customer base that we have to tap into having a smart work. Our total addressable market is going to be a global platform. So global productivity at market, the service of obtainable market will work in capital, the young professionals in the in the North American productivity market. This is still valued at $5.4 billion. Furthermore, the compact annual growth rate of this global productivity market is 14.2%. We're going to be adopting an opt-in free trial structure, which means payment is gathered at the end of our 14-day free trial when the user converts to a paying customer. Even if we only capture 0.01% of our target demographic, we will have around 5,000 monthly free trial users. Then retaining 10% of that at a monthly subscription rate of $6 will give us a monthly <laughs> revenue of around $3,000. So in our first year, we project to sell 6,000 units. And considering our development cost, sales and marketing, our first year net income will be around $8,000 which will increase in this rapidly growing price to the market. Even though the productivity market is a really crowded space, 25th hours focus on personal reflection sets it apart in a pretty niche category. So the indirect competitions that we compare ourselves to are Google Calendar, Calendly, and Calendar apps like Motion. And the problem with these apps is that they only focus on one directional response to users' problem. So like scheduling or getting things done. But 25th hour focus on this bi-directional interaction we have with the users. So as a user gives our app, we'd be able to help them find a sweet spot for their ideal lifestyle. And we've talked to USC's Cortex Center for Learning and Creativity. This is an on-campus resource for students struggling with time management and also productivity. And what we learned from the learning specialists is that there's a clear need for a tool to help students be more aware of how they manage their time, proving there's an unmet need in the market and a potential enterprise collaboration. Moving forward, we're going to build up our MVP and partner with USC's Cortex Center and test with a, a small group of users to refine our MVP. And we're going to soft launch in March with a group of um, college students and official launch in April. So, last but not least, we are the right team to work with because our team consists of four passionate young professionals with experiences ranging from business development, software development, product strategy, and product design. We all have the startup experience working in industries ranging from crypto to tech to entertainment, and collectively we have 10 plus years of experiences working on products. But more importantly, we all juggle with work-life balance, so we first have to understand the struggle. We are not only here to help ourselves, but help you. And we already have over 200 prospective customers on our wait list. We also have wide industry connections with occupational therapists and institutions who are willing to support us. So if you want less time spent on procrastination and more of what matters to you in your life journey, start the 25th hour and start prioritizing you. Thank you. Pop-up shop. 
As you can see here, by Vogue, CNBC, Circus and Kennel, they've all published articles stating that pop-up shops are becoming the dominant player within the retail or the physical retail environment within the future. However, there's a problem with this. Brands and companies don't have easy access to short-term retail locations in a centralized way. So what is our solution? We've created a pop-up as a service online platform where companies can browse, book, and curate their own pop-up locations. Essentially a one-stop shop for pop-ups. As you can see in our platform, our homepage is really simple. We stress that we have the easiest way to curate pop-ups. You can look at location, you can look at the type of store you want to do, and you can look at duration. This brings you to our product page where you see details about different aspects of, uh, of the USC Village, for example. You have square footage, how many stores they have, and then eventually, looking at a calendar, what availability they have. Using our booking function, it will bring you to our personalized curation page, where we connect you with a personalized pop space curator, Vanessa, who can customize your floor plan on the left-hand side in the live feed. For example, you want your rack on the right-hand side of your store, or on the left-hand side, she'll be able to change that for you in a live feed transaction. As well as looking at your storefront and being able to plan out your marketing and your branding needs. So what is our business model? Essentially, we take a 20% fee on all of our transactions on the platform and charge a 25% duration fee based on square footage. Our 25% duration fee is actually on the lower end of competitors if you were to bring in an interior design. We did this on purpose because we want to focus on the transaction fee portion. We want to get as many customers into our shops, into the platform, so that we can start snowballing early on. We believe pop space captures an incredibly lucrative market opportunity. Due to COVID-19, retail vacancies are at an all-time high. But pop space allows property owners to fill their vacant leases and gain additional revenue. And looking at some vacancy statistics, we calculated that our total payable market is around $27 billion. But as we're focusing on the LA area to start, our serviceable market will be around $50 million. In the long term, even if we gain just 10% of this market, we're looking at $2.7 billion annually. In order to capitalize on this market opportunity, we create a go-to-market plan that starts in the LA area first, <coughs> and then moves to national expansion. We're currently in conversations with two malls, Westfield Century City and Westfield Topanga. Once we lock down the location in either of these malls to work as a pop-up store, we can then go about targeting interested customers. In terms of our target market, we will be focusing on e-commerce companies. That is because in multiple conversations with e-commerce companies like Lunia and Hawkers, we found that e-commerce companies are eager to jump into retail. They want to provide their customers with interactive, in-person experiences. However, they haven't been able to make this jump because of the inflexibility of leases that are two years or longer. So, now that we've solved this problem for e-commerce companies, we will target them through direct outreach on LinkedIn and email, as well as meeting business owners at events that are sponsored by Eventbrite. In addition, we want to create corporate partnerships with, with e-commerce platforms like Shopify and Squarespace in order to better access our target market of e-commerce companies. So looking at our competitors, we are actually focusing on two differentiating aspects. One is providing short-term leases, and another is having a public curation assistance service. And as you can see from the grid, Top is the only company on the top right-hand corner. Our competitors, such as Storefront and Peerspace, are both online platforms that provide and offer short-term and flexible renting. However, most of their companies are not retail locations, and our places, such as open spaces or rooftops, are directed towards more personalized events. On the other hand, Loopnet is a more traditional leasing company where they focus, where they focus on long-term leasing. However, uh, they focus not only do they focus on long-term leasing, they only um, connect you with um, real estate brokers. Great. So why are we the team to solve this problem? We're really passionate about it, feeling that we're first readers in the market. We felt like we struck, we like came upon an opportunity that has to be uh, essentially that has to be executed as fast as possible. Personally, I have experience growing and scaling startups. My first company was a software business where I scaled it to earn around three million dollars in revenue and then sold it in 2019. Uh, now transitioning into a financial skill set uh, through internships in investment banking, focusing on software at a full time. Based on my past experience, I co-founded a startup where I developed an iOS app that promotes cafes in Taiwan. 
and based on my experience in app based and web based development, I can apply my skills in developing and building our web based platform to ensure the best user experience for our potential clients. In my past experience, I worked at a startup company for a year and a half where I ran all the supply chain and logistics for a health foods company uh, for around 35 plus products. And that's why I believe I'm the right person to tackle all the operational challenges that we're going to be having with setting up multiple pop up stops and you know, an expanding number of retail locations. So, in terms of timeline, well, first, we're going to lock down our first location in LA, and we're going to begin beta testing for our web-based platform. Next, we're going to apply to incubators such as YC, Techstars, etc. Next, in March 2022, we're hoping to raise sufficient seed funding. With sufficient seed funding, we're, gonna, we're thinking of scaling our uh, scaling pop space to around 10 plus locations in LA, specifically. And with that momentum, uh, we're hoping to scale pop space nationwide in December and uh, target big cities like San Francisco. In terms of our long-term vision, uh, we are planning to redefine retail leasing by providing brands, e-commerce companies, access to short-term yet flexible leasing, and also creating the path for experience-driven shopping events for our potential consumers. At PopSpace, we envision a future where any company or any brand can come to us and curate a pop-up shop or have a solution to a physical retail space. We hope that you can be along for the ride. Thank you very much. Future overseas scaling, we think this would be very 
analyzing a market, we arrive at our TAN 7 stock. So our TAN consists of 64,000 nightclubs in the US with a market size of $25 billion. Our stand consists of 1,600 nightclubs in Los Angeles with a size of $627 million. And our song consists of all the nightclubs within the five mile radius of USC, which is $17.26 million. As well, this is model, you can charge um, nightclubs $49.99 a month to be featured on Skip Seat, which will allow consumers to use the aforementioned features that we talked about with these clubs. Additionally, we will also be charging a 1% commission in revenue on all orders placed through Skip Seat as a sort of convenience fee. On the consumer end of things, we are deciding to make Skip Seat free to use, however, there will be advertisements inside to generate ad revenue for Skip Seat. Here's a list of the financial projections for the next three years that we have kind of estimated based on research, as well as estimates in the nightclub industry for costs and operating expenses, as well as revenues. This also includes the cost of ad development as well as ad maintenance. As you can see, we're, making, we're not making a profit in year one, and this is because ad development costs are extremely high. However, as more and more nightclubs begin to use Skipsy and we gain traction in years two and three, we expect to make a profit. After analyzing our competitors, we realized that other tab management apps do exist, such as Overflow, Mobile, and Barfay. However, none of them are able to provide a full list of features that we previously mentioned. Our competitive advantage lies in the fact that we manage both waitlist and bar service operations. And especially, we feel that our bidding feature is novel and will be welcomed by the consumers, but also profitable to the clubs. With all of that being said, this is a timeline for what's Thank you everyone for listening and stay safe.